You have the scriptures that come for us in the lectionary in the Sundays after Pentecost. There must be a skinny verse here before me. (laughs) (laughs) The scriptures that are assigned to us in the Sundays after Pentecost always show us very real people coming to a very real Jesus with issues and problems and situations. And the reason we have what's called ordinary time in the church calendar is because, let's face it, we all live ordinary lives, don't we? I don't think there are any superstars or celebrities here. No one's looking for anybody's autograph as we walk out of here. So ordinary time is all about trying to figure out how our ordinary lives are touched by the Word of God. And so they're very important lessons that we get in navigating this world with our lives from the Sundays that follow Pentecost. Now last week, you may remember, if you were here, that we talked about a sinful woman who gathered every ounce of courage that she had to walk into a Pharisee's house and kneel at Jesus' feet and wash his feet with her tears dry them with her hair, and then anoint his feet with the most precious and expensive perfume of the day. And the story asks us, are you Simon the Pharisee saying, who is this that has no place here? Or are you Jesus saying, back off Simon, she has done more for me in her act of love than you have done in your feast of much. Well, today's story also comes from Luke. Luke, the wonderful storyteller. But Luke gives us a story today that most of us are very familiar with. The eighth chapter of Luke actually could be a whole sermon series. As a matter of fact, when I looked at the next few Sundays coming up, I was looking to see if the lectionary was going to follow Luke 8 all the way through for the next few Sundays, and unfortunately it doesn't. They've selected this one portion out of the, the chapter because it, it is a sermon series, trust me. But uh, it's all about the authority of Jesus. Real authority. Now the verses that came before our lectionary passage for today, Jesus has said, to his disciples, okay, let's get in the boat and go to the other side of the lake. And while they're out in the middle of the lake, the great storm comes up. And Jesus is sleeping in the bottom of the boat. And all the disciples are terrified. Their lives are going to be lost. They're worried when they have Jesus with them. They haven't learned much yet, have they? So Jesus wakes up and he calms the storm simply with his voice. And we see that Jesus has full control and authority over the natural world. And then the stories that come after today's passage show us that Jesus has true authority over hopelessness and despair when we read the story of the woman who had the issue of blood. And she says, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I will be And so she made her way through the crowd and did just that. And simply by touching the hem of his cloak, she was cured of all the things that the doctor could do. And right after that, we read the story of Jairus' daughter who had died. And Jesus raises her from the dead, proving to us once again. He has authority over death. So there's some real authority coming at us in chapter 8. And in our passage today, we find that Jesus has authority over misery and isolation. Now I want to tell you that a lesson is only words on a page 
unless we're willing to do something with it. Unless it applies to our life, it is simply a fun story. So, I invite you to think with me when we get into reading the scripture this morning about how it applies to your life. Because in every lesson that Jesus teaches us, we are seeing the character of God and we're seeing how God feels about his people and how the glory of God is revealed to us through the acts of his son, Jesus Christ. Today's portion from Luke 8 shows us very clearly, in my opinion at least, as many times as I've read it and heard it, it shows to me that God is not blind to the evils of isolation, and God is not blind to the exclusion of His children from the communities that they belong in. Jesus does not turn His back on those in need. And he offers instruction to those who act out of fear instead of love. So if you would like to follow along with me this morning, I do invite you to turn to the 8th chapter of Luke. And we'll begin reading this morning with the 26th verse. And I invite you to hear the word of God. They sailed to the region of the Gerasenes, which is across the lake from Galilee. When Jesus stepped ashore... He was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes, nor had he lived in a house, but he had lived in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and he fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had commanded the impure spirit to come out of the man. Many times it had seized him, and though he was chained hand and foot and kept under guard, he had broken his chains and had been driven by the demons into solitary places. Jesus asked him, What is your name? Legion, he replied, because many demons had gone into him. And they begged Jesus repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. There was a large herd of pigs feeding there on the hillside. The demons begged Jesus to let them go into the pigs, and Jesus gave them permission. When the demons came out of the man, they went into the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When those tending the pigs saw what had happened, they ran off and reported this in the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone out of, sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people how the demon-possessed man had been cured. Then all the people of the region of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them, because they were overcome with fear. So he got into the boat and he left. The man from whom the demons had gone begged to go with him. But Jesus sent him away saying, Return home and tell how much God has done for you. So the man went away and told all over town how much Jesus had done for him. This is the word of God and it can be trusted. Thanks be to God. Now, after hearing that, if you're expecting a sermon with, about demon possession with references to the exorcist or some other macabre movie with heads twisting around and pea soup, uh, you may be disappointed. I hope not, because in my opinion, this story really is not about demon possession. It is not about demon possession. Quite honestly, in 21st century America... We have no idea what exactly possessed this man or caused him to run naked among the tombs. It could have been some form of mental illness, which first century was not able to put their finger on or do anything about, or maybe it was some sort of seizure disorder or other physical disorder that affected the man's behavior. It could have been a thousand demons. Maybe he was consumed 
by a demon of hatred. We're told there were thousands of them. He was a legion, called legion because uh, that refers to a thousand men in a Roman army. So we're assuming that he had at least a thousand demons in him. So he was in pretty bad shape. Could have been the demon of hatred. I think we have seen how the demon of hatred has consumed so many people as we look at the terrorism that has gone on around our world. Just a week ago in Orlando, one person was so consumed by a demon of hatred that he walks into a place of peace in a sanctuary and takes a gun and shoots it. One year ago, a man so consumed with hatred walks into a Bible study at a church in Charleston, South Carolina and opens fire and kills nine people. In 20, 2001, people so consumed with hatred for us that they don't even know hijack airplanes and fly them into buildings killing thousands. Now that's hatred. That is a demon of hatred. Maybe it was a demon of prejudice. A demon of prejudice. Growing up in the South, I know all about the demon of prejudice. All you had to do was grow up in the Jim Crow South and you will know what hatred is like. It's awful. Maybe it's the demon of homophobia. You know, right now, in Orlando, Florida, Westboro Baptist Church, is protesting the funerals and holding horrid signs in front of the families of people who have just lost their loved ones. Now that is a demon of hatred. That is a demon of homophobia. Maybe it's the demon of greed and selfishness. You can't pick up your paper any day now without reading how People are struggling to pay their bills and trying to figure out whether to buy food or their medicine, whether to go to the doctor or pay their rent, how to take care of their kids, how to take care of their families, how to put gas in the car. And on the very same page, we read that someone goes out and breaks all these laws working for Goldman Sachs and retires with multi-billion dollar Goldman parachutes. That is economic injustice. Amen. That is a demon. And a thousand demons in that man that day. But that's not what's really important. What's important to us right now is that we realize that Jesus has the authority over everything that afflicts us. What we see in today's reading is another human being haunted by real pain, real separation, real isolation, and that Jesus has the swift authority to take care of it. Whether the demons that haunted this man were from his own making, have you ever seen anyone suffering with a demon of addiction? You know what I'm talking about. Thank God I found tobacco before I found heroin. Or I would have been a horrible, horrible person. I would not be alive today. Whether it was from his own making, his own upbringing, you know, we can only blame mom and dad for so much. Maybe it was his circumstances. Maybe a genetic predisposition. We don't know. Or from whatever it was, from my reading, we know that whatever it was that consumed this man and caused him to run naked through the cemetery, whatever it was, that was preventing him from living a normal life within society or even being at peace with himself. Ultimately, whatever it was that plagued this man in today's story that we read from the Luke Gospel, Jesus had authority over it. Whatever prevented this man from being wholly integrated into his community, Jesus had authority over it, 
And He restored him to a life in which he could live as the representative of the Most Holy and High God. Let's look at three things this morning. First, let's look at Jesus. Second, let's look at the witnesses. And third, let's look at the man who was healed. Because between those three areas, we're going to find our lesson for today. In our story today, Jesus went to a land of the Gentiles. He went to an area that was not Jewish. He crossed the sea from Galilee, which was all Jewish, to a land that was non-Jewish. It was all Gentile. And he healed a non-Jewish person. So I think from this we can easily see that God does not play favorites. Jesus did not discriminate between Jew and Gentile, male and female, slave or free. He did not discriminate against any boundary set up by humanity to alienate and separate and isolate. <coughs> Jesus walks among all social classes without regard to race, nationality, religion, or orientation. Because instead of building walls, Jesus spent his entire ministry breaking down the barriers that other people had spent their lives building up. As Paul said in our New Testament lesson from Galatians 3 today, for all are one in Christ Jesus. And while our world that we live in uses every possible means to separate and segregate Jesus Christ stands with his arms open wide, inviting everyone who is tired and weary to come into those warm and loving arms for rest. While everybody else is saying, the door is closed, the living water of Jesus is available to everyone. And my friend, it all comes from one fountain. So what about the witnesses? The witnesses, people who saw what happened that day, what was their reaction to the miracle? They were afraid. They were filled with fear, and they ran. They ran in fear because they wanted to tell everybody else what they were afraid of. And we all know what happens when we speak group fear to a group, don't we? There's this mob mentality that takes over because somehow we find safety in a group of people who are just as afraid of the same thing that we are. These churches that won't open their doors to people, why are they quiet? they got them closed? Because they're afraid. And if they keep talking about it long enough, they'll convince everybody in that church to be afraid of the same things they're afraid of. My God, there might be a gay person worshiping next to me. How crazy is that? You know, you watch all these zombie movies and everything, what they do, all the half slasher movies. I know Pete does, but he loves the horror movies. But they all get into a group. And then so they can all be scared together. Because you know, when you get separated, you get killed. <laughs> but this mob mentality takes over. And everybody can be scared together. We also know that humanity is at its worst when we're afraid. We are at our worst when we're afraid. When we follow fear instead of faith, what we are doing is following Satan instead of God. Satan is the author of chaos and fear. Jesus Christ is not. You know... Over 600 times in Scripture, we are admonished as followers of Jesus Christ and as believers in God on high not to be afraid. I believe it's 603 times in Scripture, in some shape, form, or fashion, they say, fear not, do not be afraid, do not be afraid, because God knows the direction that fear will take you. Oftentimes, it's over the cliff with the demon-possessed herd of pigs. 
Fear leads us into a life of misery. It leads us into a life of anxiety and sorrow, which is all the opposite of what Jesus Christ came to bring us. The witnesses to today's miracles were so frightened, even the ones who didn't see it and only heard about it and came back, said, get in your boat and go. Get away from us. We're afraid of you. We heard what you did, and we're afraid of you. Get that boat and go back over to Galilee. As a radical and loving as Jesus is, I often wonder if he was frightened today's churches if he came into them today. If they would send him away, if they would say, you are just too radical for us, Jesus. You've got to go. Get in your boat and go. I think there are some churches that have already done that. <laughs> We want to be Christian, but we don't want to follow Christ. Finally, let's look at the man that was healed by Jesus. When all those looky-loos came from town, you know what the looky-loos are. People come look at their house but have no intention of buying it. The looky-loos. Those looky-loos came from town. They heard what was going on. They heard that Jesus had, had taken care of this guy, and they didn't believe it. Because this guy was pretty popular in town. So popular that they, you know, he broke all his chains. And he, he, was, he was a menace. So when they heard that he would change, he was different. We've got to run out and see. So they ran out and they saw this man. And when they came from town running, what'd they see? What'd they find? Not the crazy man running around naked. They found a man that was restored and whole, sitting at the feet of of Jesus listening and learning. In Jesus' day, the teacher always sat in a chair on the rock and the rabbi's followers always sat around him at his feet. It was a symbol of loyalty. It was a symbol of devotion to the teacher and what he was teaching. That they followed him. You sat at the feet of the rabbi that you followed. That man, that man who had a legion of demons removed from him, got dressed and he shaved and he washed his hair and he was all presentable and nice and he was sitting at the feet of Jesus because he responded in faith, not in fear. He was happy. He was liberated. And he wanted to hear what Jesus had to say to him. And so he went to Jesus. He sat in his face and he says, tell me, Jesus, tell me what I need to do. Tell me where I need to go. Let me follow you. Let me go wherever it is you're going. He was so excited in his newfound freedom that he wanted to leave and go in the boat with Jesus. But Jesus says, no, you stay. You stay right here because I need you to come back and tell everybody here what God. I want you to tell everybody what God has done for you. But you know, Jesus isn't sending this man back the way he found him. He's not sending him back to a crazy man. He's sending him back to someone who knows what it means to be changed. Who knows what it means to be restored to wholeness and health. Jesus isn't telling this man to go back to the way things were. He's saying, go back as a changed man capable of changed relationships. No longer was he to be this frightened, frightening, naked man. No, he wasn't running among the tombs anymore. Now he is a healed man, and he shows the grace of God every single day simply by walking down the streets of the town he came from. This man was sent to the townspeople, the garrison, these people who just hours earlier had said, oh no, Jesus, get in your boat and go. But every time this man walked down the street and he walked through the marketplace or he sat in a restaurant or he talked to his neighbor, he was living, walking proof that Jesus does not like exclusion. 
Jesus does not and will not tolerate having people sent away from community. Amen. This man was sent among the townspeople as a daily reminder of the gift of grace, of what Jesus can do and what authority Jesus has in life. He's going to help his friends overcome the fears they have every time they see him at worship, every time they see him at the store eating. He will help them be reminded of the authority of God's grace and mercy. Jesus couldn't stay with the Gerasenes as the man once called Legion. Good. Every one of us here has been healed by God through the gift of Jesus Christ. We've been freed from the bondage of sin. We've been liberated from our fear through his death and his resurrection. You know, if you ask in the United States what the number one fear is, it's not terrorism, it's death. People fear death. Jesus came to take the fear of death away. So now be scared of terrorism. <laughs> We've been freed from the bondage of sin. We've been liberated from the fear of death. And through the authority of God, we have been released from the chains of racism. We have been freed from our bondage to sexism and ageism and homophobia and anything else in our lives that prevents us from being the whole beautiful creation that God made us. Amen. We're called to show others in our community the grace that we have been shown through Christ. And we're also called to use the authority that He's given us to break the chains of fear and unforgiveness and anger and bitterness and disappointment. We have been given the command and the authority by the power of the name of Jesus Christ to call out what is evil. And through His power, not power of our own, but through the power of the gospel and the power of Jesus Christ, things can be changed. The good news for today is that through the power of the one who freed us, we have the authority to share real freedom with others. We have the freedom to share a beautiful life that comes with that freedom. Because once the chains are gone, once the chains have been broken, we live in freedom. And when we live in freedom, it is only through Jesus Christ.